Hello, welcome to Know the Faith, Defend the Faith. My name is William Hemsworth, and this is brought to you by the Tucson Institute of Catholic Apologetics. Uh, we once again have the uh, pleasure and honor of having author, uh, Catholic theologian, uh, Matthew Shaquin on the program. Matthew, how are you today? I'm doing well, William. Thank you for having me again. Uh, my absolute pleasure. Uh, today, and we're talking off the air about some of your favorite topics, and one of the ones I wanted to cover is one that has a lot of misconception, not only with our evangelical friends, but sometimes even within Catholics, and that is the topic of purgatory. And so just to get started, can you give us kind of a, a brief explanation of what purgatory is? Yes. Um, so purgatory is a process by which um, if you're – if a person dies in a state of venial or imperfect um, status, they would still go to heaven, but not immediately, because um, in order to be in the presence of God, you have to be completely cleansed. And so purgatory is a process by which the soul is purified of any um, imperfections of the soul. Um, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, paragraph uh, 1030, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification as so to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. And then it continues in the next line of uh, 1031. The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. The Church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the Church, by reference to certain texts of Scripture, speaks of a cleansing fire. And then it cites, as for lesser or certain lesser faults, we must believe that before the final judgment, there is a purifying fire. Hewitt's truth says that whoever utters blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will be pardoned neither in this age nor the age to come. From this sentence, we understood that certain offenses can be forgiven at this age but certain others in the age to come. And then the next uh, paragraph 1032 says, this teaching is also based on the practice of prayer for the dead already mentioned in sacred scripture. And this is um, from the book of Maccabees. Um, sorry, second book of Maccabees. Therefore, Judas Maccabeus made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. From the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead and offered prayers in suffrage for them. Above all, the Eucharistic sacrifice so that, thus purified, they may attain the beatific vision of God. The church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and other works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. And so, yeah, that's kind of a, and it goes on, but um, that's basically, purgatory is, is a way to, just of any imperfections and the imagery uses like a fire but it's different from like the fire of hell that is always that is also spoken of okay so in in the quotes that you read you mentioned the you, you, of course you mentioned the second book of maccabees um in the age to come i believe if i'm not mistaken correct me if i'm wrong that's matthew chapter five somewhere in there um and then y'all uh let me and then um I believe first Corinthians chapter three. So like the catechism says, it is alluded in scripture. It may not be like, like here it is. Here's, they don't mention purgatory by name, but it's like, it's a implication, if you will, based on the tradition. Do I have that right? Based on the tradition from ancient Judaism up until Christianity started. Are you referring to the, um, First Corinthians three fifteen. Correct. Correct. <clears throat> yes, that's correct. Um, and I can read that. Let me pull that one up specifically. But if someone's work is burned up, that one will suffer loss. The person will be saved, but only as through fire. That is. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. And um, 
how I've been explained this, William, is um, let's say, and this is just like a real simple example, and there could be others, but let's say, for example, a person steals from a person who had a small business. Let's say they stole $100, and then the, uh, the person had an immediate regret, let's say, the next week. And they were went back to go to the grocery store or the small business to return the hundred dollars and ask for an apology from the owner. Well, what happens if in this case the owner actually passed away? So he wasn't able to get full um reconciliation with the owner. So he can do the the best he can on his end. He could give the return the funds back to his son. Um which is commendable in and of itself, it's still not sufficient to fully repair the relationship between him and that owner. He can get forgiveness in the sacrament of penance, but it's it's that type of thing if that um those type of situations that um there's these effects that um occur because of sin, how it affects others, and if we can't fully repair those in this life. Um, but we still, uh, if we die in a state where it's not in mortal sin, but we still have those temporal effects of, of sin, uh, yeah. then there has to be, we're imperfect. We're going to go to heaven, but there's this process where, by which we are um, purged. Okay. Now you said something very important there. You said that, you know, if you're in purgatory, <laughs> you will go to heaven. Now, there's this misconception that somehow purgatory is a second chance at redemption. Um, can you speak to that, that that notion? Well, I mean, it occurs outside of time and space, so it's not like we come back as a second in a second life. Um, it's not necessarily second chance. Um, it's it's more like a complete working towards a completion. So oh, okay. it's so and another example um that I've that really makes sense to me is let's say you um you break a window. You come back and repair the window, but there's still imperfections in the glass. Um because you can't get it perfect. Because there's still gonna be those lines where the where the window pane broke. In order to be fully perfected. Uh, what will have to happen is the glass will have to be melted and then renewed or uh, basically made perfect again. So those, and, and that's kind of how that, I mean, we can only speak in, in like imagery and symbolism with this. Cause I mean, it's right. Um, any of those type of last things, um, the judgment, heaven, hell, he, uh, purgatory. I mean, we can only speak in, in things that, cause they're, Knowledge is limited, but th that's the type of process that would occur. Um, and that's why that, and for me, that it's pretty clear. I mean, fire is, I mean, because the objection to people would have is with the, uh, I guess, what objection have you heard with um, uh, 1 Corinthians 3.15? I, I, I personally have not really had a lot of contact lately with um like Protestants regarding this topic okay. um, specifically about that verse. I don't know. Have you heard anything specific about that objection, William? Well, I can tell you what I used to, what I used to say personally and what some of my friends still say. Um, one of the objections is purgatory. And of course, this is the objection. I'm not saying this. This is the objection. Yeah, of course. That yep. purgatory um, negates the finished work of Christ on the cross. Ah, uh, okay. And that kind of, um, and I think part of it is from the Protestant standpoint of salvation. It, it's a fixed, it's a one-time event. However, what that, in a way, is that safe to kind of describe it that way? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, okay. absolutely. Um, you know, the whole once saved, always saved motif, if you will. <laughs> Where it's one done, I was I was saved on August twentieth, um, two thousand nineteen, at eight twenty nine a.m., and I don't have to do anything else ever. 
that- got it. Yeah, and the pro- and um, the issue with that is is it completely discounts physical reality and time and space. Like it completely discounts the fact that we as humans live in a three dimensional world. We take up space. We live in time, or a four, sorry, four dimensional world. We live in time and space. So, I mean, and it also um, does not take into account what sins, how they have an impact on other people. Because humans are social by nature. So, anything that is beneficial that we do affects people positively. Anyone, anything that we do negatively, um, will this first of all impact our relationship with God secondly with or secondly with others and then even ourselves so that type of mindset removes us from this world which is not truth it doesn't jive with reality okay and so purgatory for me i mean the reason i love this doctrine is it makes so much sense is because it does account for um it, it accounts for um the fact that we live in time and space and that there's some situations we can't fully repair ourselves even if we have an immediate regret after deciding it like for example the stealing from a person you know the, or um if we say something bad to a family member of the phone and then something happens where they're in a coma and we can't repair that relationship with them we can get forgiveness from god um but we still have that imperfect relationship with them and thus we're still imperfect ourselves okay so purgatory is a way where i guess god finishes that perfection in us before we spend eternity with him then correct yeah and and the how how I personally understand it is like the canonized saints, those are individuals um, that, I mean, they're so holy that, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, this is maybe speculation, but they may, they may have underwent all of their purgation on earth. So they went okay. straight to heaven. Um, gotcha. So one of the, no, in some cases. Okay, so so one of the other yeah. objections that I hear a lot is, "What about the thief on the cross?" Jesus said that today he'll be with me in paradise. So that's that's another objection that normally comes up and so with, they, with purgatory. Got it. Got it. And so they're saying that at that exact right. day. But it may be um, with what you just said in regard to the saints where he underwent, you know, his torture while he was hanging on the cross and maybe he went straight, you you know, um, for speculation, but. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that's, I mean, a mystery, obviously, with um, that. I mean, there's certain saints like St. Paul who had Mm -hmm. an immediate conversion. I mean, it's rare to have, St. Augustine had a longer conversion. You know, it took decades for him to convert or, uh, you know, join the truth. Um, and it, and that thief could be, you know, one of those rare situations where he had a full-on repentance and straight-up conversion. And that combined with his, his suffering on the cross, because crucifixion was such a gruesome way to die. And then you were tortured many hours before that. That could be the case. Um, I don't think that would be enough mm-hmm. of an objective for me because, I mean, again, that's wrenching one verse. That's, the again, the, the issue with a lot of the Protestants is they take one or two verses out instead of looking at the entire picture. Right. In, in my case, the, like I said, I, it's one of the objections I used to use and as I read not only the accounts of the, you know, the early church, how they prayed for those in the catacombs in the second century and all this, I kind of realized that I was guilty of Jesus in a way, you know, taking those one or two verses and formulating mm-hmm. something from it that 
is novel, really. Now, are, what, what good resources are out there for the listeners to study up on purgatory? Uh, well, I've written a few of, from my examples. Um, and I've gotten some good feedback about, you know, I've written my experiences of what I've learned um, about purgatory. Um, there is, I use the catechism a lot too. So that's, I mean, the first thing I would go to is the catechism because um, the catechism will give footnotes to scripture from every uh, paragraph. There's, there's a little footnote number. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that section, it'll let you know what it's, what council it's referring to um, or what scripture passage it's referring to. Um, if it refers to a council, um, I usually look up that council, um, mm -hmm. just Google search the council document. So, for example, the passage I was reading, William, earlier, um, it was uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1031. That referenced the councils of Florence and Trent. So th those would be good resources to look up um, right. there. And... Sometimes um, when you look at those council documents, those will have footnotes in and of themselves. And at that point, they either reference a past council or they directly reference scripture. If they reference scripture, then great. I mean, they're going to tie you back to the same similar scripture that um, we were just discussing, 2 Maccabees, 1 Corinthians 3.15 and others. If it references a even earlier council, that's great because you can see the continuity and the de and also the development of doctrine when you look at different councils. And then from there, it'll either um, reference scripture directly. Likely, the earlier the council, it's going to more directly reference uh, scripture because uh, because the first few, you know, they uh, you know now we have like twenty one ecumenical councils. So there's a lot to refer to. Um, but eventually it's going to tie back directly to scripture. And if you look at all of the, follow that path, and that's something I, when I took a, a course on the catechism, um, what helped me is just, we, we studied all the footnotes and we looked how they kept, it was almost kind of like a, uh, pathways, um, to, or, uh, passageways to like back, either back mm -hmm. in time or just kind of following the train of thought. And so that's what I always suggest doing is first read the catechism. That'll give it to you in the plainest language. Secondly, go to the, um, uh, the footnotes and that will go to whatever it refers you to. And if it refers to a council, then, you know, look at those footnotes and eventually lead you to scripture. Um, if you wanted some additional resources, um, I did start to mention my, I have a few posts on my uh, blogging website where, and I do reference um, the catechism too in those, uh, but it's kind of from my perspective in examples that I have either learned thought of myself that makes sense and that are in continuity with the teaching of the church or something that a priest or another, um, okay. or like a professor of mine that has taught me um, about how to explain purgatory. And so um, I can send you those links. Um, I, I think I've written about three or four of those articles. So that, those are just a few examples of ways um, a resource. Right, and the, of course, the website more more about this blog is the simplecatholic.blog, and I'll definitely include those links in the show notes. And like you said, the catechism is a wealth of knowledge in there. You could read all those councils and mentions, the scripture passages. And folks, the bottom line is purgatory. If you're if you go to purgatory you're assured of heaven. It's not a, it's not like a third eternal destination that you're in. It's not a second chance at redemption. You've already been judged. You just have to be purified before you go into the holiness and presence of God first. Um, Matthew, I appreciate your time uh, discussing exactly. this topic. Hope that it clears up a lot of questions for someone out there. And again, check out Matthew's blog, the simple Catholic dot blog. And of course, his posts on Epic Pew are, excuse the pun, they're epic as well. They're really good. So check those out. And Matthew, thanks.
Thanks for thanks for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. And then um, if anyone wants to reach out to me too, I'm on LinkedIn. So if you have any further questions, um, you can message me or William's really great too and knowledgeable. So reference out, you know, reach out to him. Um, either of us would be happy to talk about uh, this topic because, I, I mean, there's a lot of, it's a major uh, topic. So I appreciate you bringing me on to discuss this. this is one of my favorite That's my teachings pleasure. of the church. And yeah, my pleasure. Very like I said, you reach out. And and I'm, awesome. I'll be glad to answer. And I can also get you in touch with Matt, who you can clarify things as well. So, Matthew, um, thanks for taking the time just to come on. I really appreciate it. All right. God bless. Just a yeah, I really my appreciate it. Pre oh, right, pleasure, bless. William. Have a nice day. Yeah, it was my absolute pre oh, pleasure, William.